Hello, I'm Danny. And I'm Christian. And today we're going to be looking at two paintings by Italian artists. Uh, Stigmata of St. Francis by Giotto. And The Calumny of Apelles by uh, Sandro Botticelli. Right here is St. Francis receiving the Stigmata. Uh, Christ appears as a seraphim to St. Francis on Mount Laverna and gives him the stigmata. So, what's going on with this Christ figure? Why does he have six wings? Uh, he, well, as we see, he's in the air, he's flying. He doesn't really have six wings. It's just um, the medieval way of portraying motion. Like, along with these lines, too. Like, there, the stigmata is literally coming from Jesus going to St. Francis. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I can see other uh, medieval influences in the picture, such as the uh, the halos, the literal halos surrounding their heads. Yeah. Giotto spent 1295 to 1300 on this piece, and that during that time, that was literally the time from High Middle Ages to the early Renaissance. And what's changing in this time is that Giotto and other Italian artists are trying to be more naturalistic. They're trying to be more real with what's going on. We see that uh, he's kneeling, he's looking up, his hands are uh, in motion. We see kind of more 3D-ish 3D effect with the fold of his robes and the shadows and whatnot. And how this mountainside goes up behind him and the buildings are smaller to show that there's depth here. There's depth in this picture. It's not just flat like old... Uh, middle age paintings, they're moving on to trying to give depth to art. So up until this time, people were painted, well the saints were painted in non-earthly, heavenly spaces, like they were just painted and there were things around them, but now Giotto is, he has placed Francis in an earthly setting, there's trees, there's a mountain, there's these houses. Yeah, but what about this gold sky in the background? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, the gold sky is also another flashback of the medieval ages. The gold sky was definitely representing um, a holy aura that Jesus is uh, giving off. This is this divine presence. Yeah, this, there's something divine going on here. It's almost like we're now yeah. seeing sort of this uh, union between earthly and... Uh, Heavenly realm. Yeah. Earthly and divine, the Sakharin Profanos is definitely side by side in this painting. There's a definite reverent tone about St. Francis in this. Yeah, he's on one knee, he's looking up with his hands up, he's showing uh, surrender, fear, uh, wonder, probably even like relief and acceptance that Jesus is showing himself to him and giving them this gift of the faithful, this stigmata. But also a sense of awe. Yeah. Like he's taken aback by you know, this honor. He is almost like, am I really seeing what I'm seeing right now? That's kind of what I get from that. Yeah. From his yeah, face. Tell me about uh, these three panels on the bottom. So these three panels on the bottom are as the kind of like the rest of the story of St. Francis. Francis was a mendicant, which was a beggar. He gave up his worldly possessions to live a simpler, more godly life in honor of Christ. But the church was not too sure if they were to accept, you know, Francis' ideas because they were really comfortable in their wealth and stuff back then. This first one to the left is St. Francis holding the church. Uh, Francis in 1209 went to Rome to get his new Franciscan order approved by Pope Innocent III. So the Pope had a nightmare that uh, the Lateran Basilica was falling and as it was falling St. Francis comes and starts supporting it by his uh, brave intervention. The middle one is the church accepting St. Francis's order. It was accepted because of this Pope's dream. And the third one is Francis doing what he was really most famous for as a saint. Uh, this is supposedly to take place in the south of Umbria in Italy, in this place called Bavagna. It's known for its rich bird life, and he was just reminding the birds, Hey, animals, like, you have it good. Remember the Lord made you.
All right, so we're going to move 200 years into the future, uh, into the middle of the early Renaissance, and look at Botticelli's Calumny of Apelles. Okay, so describe this scene to me. What's going on here? Yeah, this was actually Botticelli's uh, recreation of a painting by the ancient Greek artist uh, Apelles. Apelles' work had all been lost by this time, um, so Botticelli made this based off of a description of the painting by the Greek writer Lucian. So Botticelli had a story to base this painting off. He didn't actually have like models or anything. This is all a story and his visual interpretation of it. Yeah, like as you're looking at these figures, these are these figures are what Botticelli got from Lucian. These... They all represent different um, feelings or emotional yeah, actions, yeah. right? Yeah, like... these are human representation of these abstract ideas. The painting is named The Calumny of Apelles, so essentially what we're seeing in this scene is the slandering of Apelles. Calumny is just another word for slander. Apelles being represented by this man, this naked man being dragged by his hair. Okay, so that's Apelles and the calumny of Apelles, I'm guessing that girl right there yeah, dragging him, is yeah, that this so? This woman forcefully pulling him across the floor represents slander. What are these two girls uh, fixing her hair? Like, what, are, what do they represent? Oh, these two women are cunning and deceit. So you can kind of think of them as, uh, you know, the assistants to slander. Yeah, because they kind of go hand in hand. And I see uh, Calumny is being led by the arm by this guy. Oh, she's holding a torch. Yeah, the torch in her hand, uh, you can kind of see, represents sort of that wrath that comes along with slander. I mean, if you're looking at Calumny's face, she looks very peaceful. I mean, you can see cunning and deceit or even putting flowers into her hair. She looks beautiful. Her clothes are colorful. Um, she looks young uh, and kind. But really, she's... It's a trick. It's, it's, a it's trick. deceitful. Yeah, exactly. And you can see that in this burning torch she holds in her hand. <clears throat> okay, and so this guy right here, this guy holding her, what does he represent? Yeah, this man leading slander by the hand, he represents envy. And you can see this is a uh, representation of how envy is what leads to slander. And looking at envy, you can see how there's no hiding of his intentions. His face looks angry and he's even pointing directly at uh, this man seated on the throne. Mm. Now this man, as Lucian describes him, is a judge with the ears of Midas. Now based off of that description, Botticelli drew this man with donkey ears and kind of like to insult him right yeah it really was an insult to this judge perhaps in the original painting by Apelles he was angry at the judge who it looks like envy has the upper hand like envy is more confident yeah, than this guy yeah you can even see it in his hand it says if he's uh, beckoning him to wait to you know to slow down and this judge is definitely not comfortable and, and there's two girls uh, touching his ears it looks like I guess they're whispering so these two women at his sides represent uh, ignorance and suspicion. So, you know, mm. them whispering into his ears, it's, it's like they're helping to cause his confusion. They're helping to cause all of this stress. Okay, so let's move over to the left side. You'll see a uh, woman, an old woman, cloaked in a uh, black robe with her face covered. Now this woman actually represents repentance or remorse. Mm. Now, this is a really just ingenious depiction of remorse by Botticelli because he's depicted remorse really old. Yeah, really old. This is conveying the sense that remorse comes much later. It's far into the future before the slanderer will even feel sorry. And now she's looking she's looking back towards this naked woman that looks like Venus. Oh, now this woman in the at the far left is truth. She's oh. far away from all the other figures. Yeah, her positioning is significant because it's almost like in this whole episode, Truth was left behind. Hmm. Truth was uh, in the background as all this slandering was going on. Now, her nudity is also significant. It's kind of giving this idea that uh, the truth has nothing to hide. You know, it's... The naked truth. Yeah, literal depiction of that. Exactly. Okay. Okay, so now that we've seen what both of these paintings are about, we can look back, we can look at them together and see how the technique of the Italian artist 
change from the high Middle Ages to early Renaissance. And when you're just taking this picture in, you can see this very realistic sense of perspective. Now, uh, artists in Florence had uh, mastered this idea of linear perspective. We saw uh, Giotto, you know, trying to work at adding depth to a piece. Yeah, we definitely saw the depth. It wasn't just flat, flat but it wasn't but then, too... Yeah, you notice, like, the buildings accurate. were still kind of... The know, yeah, his house is like, as big as his calf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, the trees were really tiny, maybe they it looked like he could hold them in his hand, but here you're actually seeing this uh, large, room. large room, this uh, like wonderfully painted uh, kind of Romanesque arches and uh, uh, these sculptures and reliefs all painted into it and looking like they are indeed behind the people, but not awkward in, in any way. Yeah, everything is to its correct proportion now.